Well, did we just hear some, uh, I, I forgot to, let me go back a moment. I forgot to make the disclaimer at the very beginning is, is that we may be hearing different opinions. And I think that that is very important for all of us is because there's a lot of information out in the groups and that's even reflected in a lot of the questions that we're asking. And I really appreciate that the surgeons all share that these, these are their experience, these are their opinions. Um, and with that being said, let's ask some additional questions of the panel. So I'm gonna start with, uh, actually I'm gonna start down there with um, Dr. Gutowski, what order do you recommend the surgeries take place? I usually tell the patients, let's treat the area that's hurting you the most first, but it has to make sense. If someone has big calves and big thighs, it doesn't make sense to treat their thighs and leave their big calves there because then you can't get compression on. So we come up with a strategic plan for each patient based on really what their needs are, but it, it, it's patient-based. The answer is patient-based. Does anyone else have a different answer? Yeah, I, I do like to, uh, it, I mean, again, if they have, sometimes I, we, we will, in, in rarer cases, I will do the calves first, but I, I like to do uh, centrally because it takes some pressure off the lower leg. I, um, I break the body up into kind of front and back. I don't like to go circumferential around a leg during a procedure. I think possibly higher risk of blood clots, things like that. So I start, whether it's worse in the back or the front, I start there and I'll do the whole front of the leg and I try to go as far back as possible, it makes my next surgery easier, and then we come almost more than 360. Okay. For us, uh, we, so uh, in my last talk, I said 100% of the lipedema patient in our experience have lymphatic dysfunction. So some of the lipedema patient will require lymphatic reconstruction after debulking. So which part to treat, what procedure to do, needs to take the lymphedema reconstruction into consideration. So for some patient, they're not really great candidate for LVA, which is the least invasive procedure, which is what most lymphedema patients want. But we know that after liposuction, which is, in our experience, lymph enhancing. It would improve their lymph drainage. So we would perform liposuction first to improve their lymph drainage and then use those improved lymph drainage to perform LVA. So it, it's really an involved question. Where to treat, what to do. Uh, so both condition needs to be taken into consideration. And Dr. Chen, I'll start with you this time on the next question. Uh, do you have any BMI limits that you would adhere to? Uh, we do, although um, uh, our BMI uh, cutoff was instituted for uh, mostly for lymphedema patient because most of the, and our cutoff was initially at 35 and we were increasingly dropping it down, we're currently at 30. The reason is so many of the lymphatic reconstruction procedure is dependent on a healthy venous system. When BMI is high, not only that the lymphatic system is affected, the venous system is also affected. So as the patient gets heavy, our lymphatic reconstruction becomes increasingly ineffective. But we are seeing also that we recognize that lipedema patients tend to have high BMI. And I was just learning from uh, Karen uh, about other ways to, towards the end, we want, to, we want surgery to be successful and safe. So um, I do think that with lipedema, we should institute a different surgical cutoff for BMI, although that is still a question that we are working on right now. I have the opposite point of view. I think BMI cutoffs for lipedema are kind of silly because you treat the problem, not a BMI. Um, as long as it's safe, as long as our anesthesiologists are comfortable with positioning, because that's an issue, I've made it work. I've had patients with BMIs in the mid-50s and we've done their arms, we've done their legs, they've been very happy, but it's a team effort. You can't just go to any hospital and expect they're gonna be able to deal with it. I've worked very hard with our hospital system. We have the same team, same group every time. We, I educated the whole anesthesia providers and everyone involved on what we're doing, how we're gonna position them, the nurses on the floor, and we've done it and patients have been happy. 
and it's been done safely. I'll just agree. Um, we have a medical team that helps us. We have a director, of, a director of anesthesia. We have part of our medical practice. We all look at every single aspect of it. BMI is one and probably the smaller aspect of it. But we all look, we don't really have cutoffs. We look at what's going to be the safest for that patient. Mm -hmm. Well, we, uh, you know, we, we tend, uh, I'm going to say we tend to around 50, 55. We do look at uh, waist to hip ratio, so we have some leeway. Um, but certainly w far north of uh, the 50s, uh, we, we uh, generally um, consider there's some secondary obesity and, and, and recommend that uh, that be addressed first. The next question, and we'll start with Dr. Wright this time. For best long-term results, what should be done first, a knee replacement or liposuction? So, so I, I, I think liposuction, um, and, and for several reasons. One, as, you, as, as, as we showed, you, you get improved range of motion. You're going to have a better recovery uh, just from debulking the lipedema tissue. You're going to have improved mechanics, and that's going to help you through the whole perioperative period of your knee surgery. So, um, I, I, I mean, in, unless, uh, so almost always I would recommend the, the lipedema reduction first. It's funny, that's one of the catch-22s you get. So the orthopedic surgeon won't operate because they can't get to the knee and the BMI is too high and then you, so I mean, we see that we're actually treating the lipedema first, and it's usually consequence because they can't, the orthopedic surgeons won't actually treat. Uh, I'm in favor of liposuction first, but uh, out of concern for infection. So prosthesis and infection don't mix, and so it would be best when we perform surgery, there is a risk for infection. It could be a very minor infection without prosthesis, it would be very well tolerated. Probably a course of oral antibiotic would take care of it. But if the patient already had knee prosthesis in there, we can contaminate that prosthesis and resulting in the knee prosthesis needing to come out. Definitely liposuction first. Dr. Schwartz, we'll start with you this time, and this will be our final question. Are there any standards as far as certifications or qualifications when seeking out a surgeon to perform liposuction specifically on lipedema patients? And in other words, how do you know what to look for in order to find a surgeon knowledgeable when it comes to lipedema? It's a very difficult yeah, question to answer, but right? thank you, Cheyenne. I You're welcome. I can't show graphic images, and then I have to answer this. Um, you know, I, the, way, the way I look at it is lipedema is very challenging anyway. It's very complex. There's a lot more. There are high complications. There's a lot more. I would look at people that have had done a lot of the procedures. I would also talk to patients that have been through it, good and bad, by the way, because this is never, I always tell people, we want to get to here. A lot of times it's like this. Um, but I think it's just experience. And, um, you know, and also when you're, when you're meeting with them, it, you have to connect. You have to understand that you're, you're treating the same thing and the person understands. And sometimes the surgery plans are different. And so I think it's where you people know what's right for them. Does anyone else have I anything would add to one add? Thing, yeah. Insurance companies are not going to want to send you outside their network. And they may have no one in their network who knows how to deal with lipedema. I mean, right here, you've got for very, very experienced people, I would say there's probably not more than 10 times this in the country who know how to deal with this. They're probably not in your insurance network. And most plastic surgeons don't go over 5,000 cc's. Most of them won't think about assessing the venous system, the lymphatic system, or taking out the skin at the same time. We've been doing this for many, many years. You will get shunted to somebody in your insurance plan who is one or two years out of training and just does cosmetic lipo, like some of us do, nothing wrong with that. And they will look at the lipedema patient, oh my God, what am I supposed to do with this? But that's who they're gonna send you to. So yes, this is probably a specialty that is gonna evolve at some point to have, I don't know if we can certify, but we're gonna be, ex we are experts on it and we want other people to be experts, but we're not there yet. And insurance companies are the ones that are determining where you go. And it's oftentimes someone who has no experience in this. 
Well, thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and ask the next group of um, surgeons to come up, but let's give a warm thank you to all of them.